before we turn our hearts to God's word, we're going to just have a word of prayer. Father, we just ask right now, Lord, you say that your word is like a fire that burns up the chaff and it's like a hammer that breaks rocks in pieces. And so, Lord, we trust you that it will accomplish the purposes for which you have sent it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we finished our study in the book of Philippians last week. And so we're going to do just a single message from Ecclesiastes chapter 3 today. And I want to invite you to join me in an adventure that really officially is going to start in January, but we're going to start it to kind of get your feet wet and get you in the rhythm so that when we really officially take off, it would be what you call a a soft opening for this this event. I don't know if you uh, have ever had that that strong conviction you needed to change something about your health in January. So uh, you're going to lose this much weight. You're going to go to the gym. And you go that first week to the gym and you hurt yourself so bad you can't work out for a month. Uh, only us old people know what that's like. You know, what are you talking about? But, uh, you know, it's because we, we get a little too aggressive, right? And um, what we're going to do in January is we're going to read through the Bible in three years. Now, I'm not going to have you raise your hand, but... The majority of Christians that come to know Jesus as their Savior have never read this incredible book from Genesis to Revelation. And we want to be able to get you into God's Word. It's the Spirit of God working through the Word of God that transforms the people of God. And so in January, we're going to start in Genesis. We're going to read a chapter a week. And uh, then, so that's seven chapters in a week. And then, then my message, or excuse me, a chapter a day seven chapters in a week, and then my message will come from that seven chapters. We're going to start that in January. But to get your feet wet, uh, we're going to start this week in 1 Corinthians. So read the first seven chapters, a chapter a day in 1 Corinthians, and it'll take you, depending on if you're a fat, I'm a slow reader personally, it might take you, for those fast readers, it might take you 10, 12 minutes. For those who are fast, uh, slower readers, it might take you 15 to 20 minutes, especially if you underline and think about some things. And then on s- next weekend, on Sunday, I'll share a message from those seven chapters. And just for fun, before service, I'll be out in the lobby. You can try to guess which passage I'm going to s- teach out of those seven chapters. And so what we're going to do, starting in January, is the mi- mix the people's reading with the pastor's preaching on Sunday mornings. And it's a pace that's slow enough. Right now we have a through the... Bible in a, uh, reading through the Bible in a year, and that's just a little too aggressive for some people. And so we're slowing it down, but I want you to just think about this. If you join with us starting in January, three years later, you're going to be able to say, you know, I've read the entire Bible. Now, I find that people get discouraged in two ways. They go on vacation or they miss here or there, and, and, you know, it's been a week since they read, they kind of give up. Hey, just forget that, start over. We're going to go through it again three years later, so just, just pick right back up. The other thing is, is you get in really difficult passages, and uh, there's parts in the Bible that are very laborsome, and we have genealogies and things that are kind of boring sections of Scripture, but along with that, we're going to put just a nugget of Psalms and Proverbs through every day of the year, so you'll go through Psalms and Proverbs three times in a three-year period of time. So there will always be good food there for you, all right? So uh, I, I don't know if any of you, is, is there anybody here that would like to join us, though this is soft and open, in January to read through God's Word in three years? All right, praise the Lord. That's awesome. Because honestly, about 15% to 20% of Christians read their Bible daily. Isn't that sad? We believe this book is telling us we're on our way to heaven. We better know what it says, right? You don't want to get to heaven and be like a country bumpkin. You don't know what's going on. You want to be able to read it. Hey, this is going to happen. Check this out. And so we're going to start that this week to kind of get your feet wet so you're in shape when we come to January. Okay, so 1 Corinthians, a chapter a day for seven days, and my message will come from it next weekend. But because of that, I wanted to take a weekend to share with you what we're going to do. And I just picked a passage of scripture that was kind of on my heart. Yesterday was uh, the first official day of summer. We are on the longest day of the year for us in the northern hemisphere. So the sun came up yesterday, today, and tomorrow, it's the three longest days of the year, at 5.47 in the morning, and the sun's going to go down at 9.11 each night for three nights. You're going to max out the longest day of the year, and summer has shown up. Now, summer doesn't show up in Idaho Falls till the 4th of July. We know that, but the official day of summer was yesterday. 
And I was thinking about that in the seasons of life. And I want you to open in your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Hopefully you have a Bible. If you're new to the Christian faith, never be embarrassed with just opening your Bible to the index, a table of contents in the front, and knowing where Ecclesiastes is. Now, it's going to come up here on the, the board, but unless you're able to write little notes in your Bibles and different things, you might forget uh, your point of reference. So in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 14, we want to look at the message embracing the seasons of life. And I find specifically that in people's life, the quality of their enjoyment and life is connected to this truth. In their relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, embracing the seasons of life they go through. And life is filled with seasons, isn't it? We're born into this world, we go through the infant stage, the crawling stage, the toddler stage, we get to the elementary years, the middle school years, the high school, college, we get married, we have kids, we raise those kids, and then they leave the house, and then we have an empty nest, and we go on to that grandparent stage of life. Life is filled with seasons. And the more comfortable you are with that, and the more you embrace it, now, through the seasons... In this passage of Scripture, Solomon's going to give us three words. He's going to say time, season, and eternity. These are three different things. Right now, if you ask me, what is the time? It's right now, right? It, this clock up here says it's 12.04. It's usually two minutes late or slow. So it's, it's 12.04. That's the time. Well, what's the season we're in? Well, it's summertime officially starting yesterday. It's a summer season, which is for three, you know, the four seasons that we have here in Idaho. But sometimes we only look at life from the time frame we're in and the season we're in, and we kind of divorce that thought process from God's eternal perspective. Because God has given us the sun and the moon, according to the Genesis account, chapter 1 and 2, the creation account, for times and seasons, right? So we have times and seasons, but God dwells outside of time in the eternal now. So he sees the, the, the past, the present, and the future all in one glance. And I like the illustration that, you know, when 4th of July parade's coming, and it's world famous, just so you know, and, you know, if you're visiting here in Idaho Falls, if you've ever been down there at the parade, you know, you pick your little location, you get your picnic chair with your wife or your lounger, and you sit there, and the parade goes by, and you see one item at a time. But, you know, if you were to fly over that with a helicopter, you would see the beginning of the parade, the middle of the parade, and the end of the parade, right? It's a matter of perspective. God sees it all. And so the way that you can enjoy life is to embrace the seasons of your life. Now, here in chapter 3, verses 1 through 8, check out what Solomon says. Let's read it through, and then we'll make a few comments. It says, To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pl pluck what is planted, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to gain, a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace." And all of us that are from my generation break out in song, turn, turn, you know, singing the bird song from uh, number one hit, 1965. And uh, I find it interesting that they give credit for writing that song to uh, Pete Seeger. That's, that's total plagiarism. Solomon wrote it a long time ago. He put a little ditty to it, and he became world famous. Well, that's beside the point. When you look at this, he tells us that to everything there is a season. And a time for every purpose under the sun. Notice those all-encompassing words. To everything there is a season and for every purpose under heaven. And he tells us what those are. Now in 14 couplets, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, depending on how you interpret them, there's 14 different couplets about the seasons of life, right? And so he starts off by saying a time to be born and a time to die. Now, you and I have to embrace this reality of life. We love when a new baby comes into the family, a new baby's born, and people celebrate and they're excited about it, but just as that new baby was born, somebody in the family also at the other end of the spectrum of life is going to pass away, correct? I, I, I'm so 
surprised by people being upended by death. Now, sometimes death does happen from our persp- human perspective prematurely, that a child dies or a teenager dies or something like that. Cancer, a car wreck, an aneurysm, something like that that breaks into our world because death is so ex- unexpected. Unexpected. It's an intruder. When it intrudes, sometimes we're, we're taken back by that. We're, we're startled by that. But he tells us there's a time to be born, right? And there's a time to die. I've noticed that when a child is born, the doctor or the nurse, they write down time of birth. When they're in the hospital and they die, time of death. Right, that's the time. Solomon, I mean, uh, the writer of Hebrews tells us in 927 of Hebrews that it is appointed for man once to die and face the judgment, that it's an appointment you're going to make. Just like you have nothing to do with showing up to be born, correct? Well, I mean, you're in there, but, you know, your, your mom's water breaks and all of that stuff. And then when you die, unless you take your own life, you also don't know the time of that. Those are two uncontrollable things that you and I step into this world. And it's always blown me away that because I actually sandblasted granite headstones and monuments for three years in the early years of my life, that the birth date and the death date is just separated by that little dash, and that represents your whole life. Now, there's something about that that's sad, isn't it? It's like, I was born, I lived 90 years, and what represents my life? This little dash right here. That little blip, it's like, it doesn't doesn't even feel like I was significant. Come on. You know, give me, at least give me a long dash, not a short little dash. No, and it's going to happen. And why is it that when death comes, people are so upended? Does it surprise you when people die? Now, granted, it can intrude and it wasn't expected. But I know people that are mad at God because a loved one passed away from cancer. Or a child died in their youth. I'm like, why would you be mad? Because you see, people don't know how to embrace life. You're born and you die. Now, I don't want to break out into a Disney song from Lion King. It's the circle. You know? The circle of life. Holding up Simba. That would mean I'm a baboon, Rafiki. Elton John in the background. It's the circle. It's, it's, it's not the circle because it, it, it's just one journey. Because we're not coming back. <laughs> we're not coming back, right? So you have to embrace the seasons of life. He says in verse 2, there's a time to plant and a time to pluck what was planted. Now we understand that. We were plant your garden, you harvest your garden. You plant your field, you harvest your field, right? I think the harvest is much more exciting than the planting, don't you? You plant it, you put a seed in the ground, you can't even see the thing. And then when it sprouts up, you're kind of excited about it. But man, the harvest is where it's exciting. You see, each one of these couplets, there's kind of a downside, or at least the less exciting side to life, right? He says in verse 3, there's a time to kill and a time to heal. There's a time to kill. There, there are times in in judicial justice, the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 9, the Lord gave this basically a command that if a man sheds another man's blood intentionally, that his life was to be taken. So there was capital crime. There, I mean, there, uh, a capital crime brought about capital punishment where you lost your life. Correct? There, there's a time to kill those, those perpetrators of injustice. Also, there's a time to heal. Maybe you're in a place of sickness and, and you're having people pray for you and the elders anoint you with oil and pray that healing supernaturally might take place. You might be under a doctor's care right now. There's a time also uh, to be healed. There's a time to break down and a time to build up. It's this picture of doing a demo. You know, you remodel the house, you tear this wall out, you build this, you, and then you build that. Now, uh, that, that's kind of a rough season, you know, you tear the house all apart, and you're trying to remodel it, and the carpet's torn up, and this, but there's a time to tear something down, and then there's a time to build something new. There's also a time to weep, and a time to laugh, and a time to mourn, and a time to dance, and these, these two couplets go together so much so, we'll just mention them together, there's a time where you cry. Maybe you're in a season of weeping right now. You're in a season of heartbrokenness. You're crying yourself to sleep because your son or your daughter is is far from God. But there's also a time to laugh. I don't know about you. I, I would rather laugh than cry, but I've discovered that in crying, oftentimes there's a other ministry that's happened in my heart because you see, God has given us emotions. He's created us in his image, and he's created us with emotions, and emotions are the alarm system of the soul. 
If I'm troubled, there's, my, my emotions are saying something's wrong with life. If I'm suddenly terrified, it's my emotions telling me, hey, watch out. The adrenaline's released, and am I, I going to run for my life, or I'm going to fight and defend myself? What's going to happen? There's nothing wrong with emotions. We're not robots. We have emotions. We cry. The shortest verse in the Bible is John 11:35. Jesus wept. Jesus was a man's man, and he cried. But there are others that say, we see Jesus wept, but we never saw that he laughed. I, I just, I don't know about you, but I, though it doesn't say it, I can't imagine a Savior that doesn't laugh. I just think he laughed with his, his disciples. That there's something that is joyful about this life. Yes, we weep, but yes, we, we laugh. We also mourn, but then we dance. There's a time to mourn for someone that we, we love and grieve. We don't grieve as those who have no hope. And then there's a time to dance. Reading some of the commentators about this, especially the old school guys, they had such a problem with dancing. A lot of churches preach against dancing. And, and I've had people that were very somber and sober come to me and say, Pastor, do you believe that Christians can dance? They're really serious. You can tell this is a major issue to them. And I just look at them lightheartedly and say, well, I've seen some and some can't. Mm. I want you to know, I can dance. I can jitterbug. I can cut a rug with my wife. If we're at a family celebration of somebody's getting married and there's a reception, then there's a time to dance. You know, be all bunched up and a bunch of sour Christians look like you've been sucking on lemons all week long. What's your problem? Loosen up a little bit. Now, he's not saying go tear it up at the bar. <laughs> you know what I mean? He's just saying, hey, there's a time to dance. There's a time to mourn. There's a time to dance. He says in verse 5, there's a time of casting away stones and a time of gathering stones. You see the children of Israel gathered stones and made piles to remember what God had done in their life. And then it says there's a time to cast away stones. You know, there's some things that, that we, we need to forget. Paul said this one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind. There's some things that I need, to, I need to cast away. I don't need a big memorial about my sin and failure. How about you? I don't need it. I don't need a big memory of that. I got it locked in. Just forget about that. Let's, let's remember what God has done. Also, they gathered stones for boundaries. This is the boundary of my field. Here's a corner. Here's a corner. Here's a corner. And God, we, we, we have boundaries in our life. That God, every one of us in this life has boundaries. God has given you a lot in life. And that's your boundaries. But there's a time to cast away those stones. There are times that the Lord wants to expand the boundaries that he's given to you. You see, there's a time for everything. There's a time for everything under the sun. He says there's a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. It's speaking of intimacy between a man and a woman. And your wife might think that it's time not to refrain. And the husband said, there's never been a time to refrain from intimacy. She's like, oh, yes, there is. Well, there's a time for everything here. In verse 6, it says a time to gain and a time to lose. There's a time in, in life and personally and, and in business and, and whatever it is, there's, there's, a, there's a time to gain. You might be in a season right now in your life personally and in, in business life and financially. Man, you're gaining. Man, you got money in the bank. Your 401k, you know, is, is growing. Your portfolio is off the chart. And you're like, woohoo! Now, that's not nearly as exciting as when you're losing, right? The stock market crashes. You lose half of it. Every time you get 1000 bucks in the bank, the transmission goes out, this goes on, this happens. But don't you know, even in the Christian's life, there's a time to gain and a time to lose? You know, I went through years in my life, about 20 years, where I'd fix homes up and I would sell them, and I always gained. So it seemed like everything I touched, I'd just fix it up, sell it, make money. It's awesome. The last five years I haven't been that way, right? It's been a time to lose. As a matter of fact, I, I had to sell a home and lose money for the first time in my whole life. I'm like, well, that doesn't seem right. Where's the blessing of God in that? Am I cursed now? You don't understand. Do you know that I think I gained, I, I learned more through having to lose than all, everything I gained? Because I learned things. I, I know what it is to have compassion on others when you're in a season of losing. I lost my job. I lost my house. I lost that boyfriend. I knew him. You should have. You want to get rid of that guy. Man, I was catch and release. Release him. Don't have any. That guy's a jerk. There's a time to gain, right? And there's a time to lose. He also tells us that there's a time to keep and a time to throw away. Check this out. Perk up. You are taking a nap. You hoarders, this is for you. Now, just for fun, how many of you love to clean stuff up and throw it away? Raise your hand. Come on. Get it back. Okay. 
Now, how many of you are emotionally attached to all that stuff? And you can't get rid of it. Raise your hand. Come on. Oh, you, now you're liars plus hoarders. <laughs> Check it out. You're t- right? You guys are all married to each other. One hand went up. I want to clean it out. Your wife, no, we can't. Can't get rid of that. That's good stuff. And what's he tell us? He said there's a time to keep and there's a time to throw away. There's time that, oh, man, I, I need to keep this. There are times, you know what, get rid of it, get rid of it, get rid of it. It's kind of like losing when you lose financially. You know what, I've got to cut my losses. I've lost. It's a season of loss. I, I'm, not, I'm not ashamed to lose because, you see, I embrace life. I'm not cut off guard when people pass away because I embrace life. He says in verse 7, a time to tear and a time to sow. The Jews would rip their clothes when something broke their heart or they grieved. They just shred it. And there's a time where extreme, you know, you're just a time of tearing in your soul. But there's also a time to sow and to, to mend that which is torn. There's a time to keep silence and there's a time to speak. God has given us two ears and one mouth. And I don't know about you, but everybody in this room probably struggles at one of those or the other. There's a time to keep silent and there's a time to speak. Some of us need to learn to be quiet more often, and some of us need to learn to speak up and actually share our hearts. So there's a time for each. I don't know if you've ever had a conversation where you you thought, it it wasn't really a conversation, you're with another person and it's a monologue and they just, they constantly talk, and you don't have give it, a dialogue is when you go back and forth, but a monologue is somebody just talks nonstop. And you leave that usually going, you know, that wasn't much of a relationship right there. Why? Because they didn't want to hear what you had to say. They just talked until they were out of breath with you and you walked away and then they talked until they're out of breath with somebody else. But some of us are quiet souls and nobody knows what's going on in your brain because you never speak. There's a time for each. There's a time to love and a time to hate. There's a time to love people, situations. There's also a time to hate situations. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is to hate all evil. I want to hate what the devil does. I want to hate what sin does. I want to hate the destruction that comes from sin in my life. I want to hate that. I don't want that in my life. How about you? You want that? I don't want that in my life. The Lord says that he hates divorce, not because he hates divorced people, but the act of divorce when two men and women they're, they're torn apart in their hearts, and many of us here in this room know the pain of that. And, and I look at divorce, I hate it. Don't you hate it? If you went through it, you hate it because it tore your guts out, right? Or as Pastor Scotty says, it's going to gut you. It's got to be intense if you're going to be <laughs> sharing this message about hating something. Well, it doesn't mean that God doesn't have grace and restoration and redemption. It just means that there's something that God hates. Is there anything you hate? Is it sin? And I don't mean another person. God doesn't give me the permission to hate people or the permission to hate my enemy. There's nobody I get to hate except the devil and sin and its consequences. That's it. There's a time to love and a time to hate. There's a time for war and a time for peace. I find some people that are, you know, it, it, I, first of all, I, I'm, a, I'm a peace-loving person, but there's a time for war. There's a time when injustice happens. There's a time that as a nation you go to war. And then, praise the Lord, hopefully you're in more years of peace. If you're so upended by any of these things, you're just upended by life itself. And you won't really have any progress in the Christian life. Because you'll be so stumbled by these 14 couplets. Think about it. You think about all that comes. Oftentimes when I've been doing weddings for a young man and a young woman... They really haven't experienced life, right? They're 20 years old. They've fallen in love. And they're in that euphoric stage. Those psychologists who study the euphoric stage of of relationships that can take place from six weeks to a year and a half, basically. And we call they're just gaga for each other. I mean, they just look at each other. Oh, you're so wonderful, you know. And you're looking at them like you you haven't woke up yet. Psychologists who study these things say that people that fall head over heels in love with someone, their IQ drops 50 points. They just, they just can't even, they can't even, you know, fathom things. And, and they don't, they're not realistic at that point, And they have an un, uh, unrealistic expectation. And you're sitting there and they're giving these incredible promises to one another. And they're saying for, you know, in sickness and in health, for richer, for poorer, for better, for worse. And you're telling them, and because they're so starry-eyed or because they're so nervous because people are there, they're really not hearing what you're saying. 
And they come in six months later. And they go, oh, pastor, I had no idea what I was getting into. I said, oh, yeah, I showed you what was, I told you what was going to happen. Oh, I no, I don't think you did. I said, oh, no, I did. I was there. You were not. Your body was present. Your brains was not. I said, we got it on tape. You promised for better, for worse. Well, it's worse. I said, well, I told you it was going to be. <laughs> we're flat broke. I told you you were going to be. Last week, she threw up in my bed. I told you sickness is coming. And like, now all of a sudden, you're like, surprise. Why are you surprised? Right? Why are you surprised by that? Because life just slapped you in the face and you were not ready for it. Isn't that true? Some people here in this room right now, life has so slapped you in the face and you are so resentful and bitter about some issue that is like a sliver festering in your hand that is red and inflamed and tender because life has slapped you in the face and you haven't discovered how to embrace all that God brings your way. And you know what? You're resentful. You're resentful. You're angry. You're, you're angry. You, you really don't have the peace and the love and the joy of the Lord overflowing in your life because you've got a beef, and you've got a beef with God. How could he let this happen? How could that go on? Well, he takes us from times and seasons to an eternal perspective. It says in verse 9 through 14, What profit has the worker from that in which he labors? I have seen the God-given task with which the sons of men are to be occupied. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. I know that nothing is better for them to rejoice and to do good in their lives, and also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor, it is the gift of God. I know that whatever God does, it shall be forever. Nothing can be added to it, nothing taken from it. God does it that men should fear before him. He takes us into this perspective of eternity. I shared with you, we have the sun and the moon for times and seasons. For the children of Israel and for many ancient peoples, as the sun turns on its axis, right, we have 24 hours in the day. Not quite. Actually, it's uh, um, 23 hours, 56 minutes. Therefore, every four years, we have a leap year. But basically, we say 24 hours as it turns on its axis, right? That's one day. And then as the, the, the earth orbits around the sun, that happens in 365 and a quarter days, or every four years, we add that leap year. Now, depending on, uh, you know, Albert Einstein, as I shared in the beginning, believe that if you could travel at the speed of light, his theory of relativity, time's relativity, he, th he believed that time could be sped up or slowed down, and it was actually a, a physical principle, if you will, that if you could travel at 186,000 miles per second, the speed of light, that time would actually stand still. It would just be the eternal now, no past, only the present, and no future. It's the eternal now, right? Now, I'm not as scientific as Albert Einstein. I have a different theory of relativity. When I'm having a lot of fun, time zooms by, and when it's a drag, it drags by. You know what I mean? Isn't that true? Have you ever, <laughs> summertime when you were a kid, I was thinking about this this week. I was watching some kids play on their bicycles, and I absolutely love summer, and I never had three months go by so fast in my entire life. I actually usually ruined much of my summer because the first day of summer break, I so dreaded that it was going to be over at the end. Every day I had this sick, it's going to be over. Oh, no, it's going to, rather than just enjoying what was going on. I broke my leg. I, I was a bull rider, and so a bull kicked me in the leg and put me in a body cast for six weeks. I was in this body cast, 19 years old, in a bed, and I had to get comfortable with a bedpan. There's nothing more heartbreaking than a 19-year-old in a body cast with a bedpan. And let me tell you, it was the longest six weeks of my life. Was there any more time in that day? Nope. Was there still 23 minutes, uh, you know, or 23 hours, 56 minutes? Yep. And it was the longest six weeks of my life. I was thinking about this because, you know, earth has times and seasons, right? But I was thinking there are certain times that, that I wish that I had Venus or Jupiter's time. Do you know what I mean by that? You, you see, 
there's some days that are so good I don't want them to end. You ever have that day? You're just like, this is so great. It's just, I, I don't want this day to end. Well, you know, on Venus, one day, like for us, it takes Venus 243 days to turn one rotation on its Earth axis. Think about it. 243 Earth days. There's, there's some days I just want this to be a Venus day where it's just like it goes on and on and on. But I wouldn't want to have Venus years. You know why? Because Venus years, basically in 225 days, it zips around the sun. If I was to give you my age and I lived on planet Venus, I would be 79 years old because it goes around the sun so many times. But there's other times, you know, I would rather have Jupiter days. You know about Jupiter. Jupiter's days are not 24 hours in the day. They're not 243 days. Jupiter days are nine hours, 55 minutes. Now that's a fast day. And, and if you're having a hard day, you just want it to be over, don't you? Who wants 24 hours? Just can we get this done in nine hours? Can I have some Jupiter days when things are bad? But I also kind of like uh, and don't like, I don't think I'd want Jupiter years. Jupiter years, you know how long it takes Jupiter to go around the sun? It takes 11.8 years. If I was Jupiter age, lived on planet Jupiter, I'd be four years old. <laughs> now, there are some days that I wish would stretch out because, man, it's a good day. And there are other days I wish they would end quick. I'll ask somebody, how are you doing today? Not good. A bad day. Bad, bad year. And you're like, ooh, that sounds bad. Let me share with you, though, what Solomon tells us. He says in verse 11, he has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. You see, God has put eternity in your heart and my heart meaning that you and I are the only creatures on this planet that are eternal creatures. God has created us in his own image for fellowship and relationship with him. And that you and I have gathered together in the house of the Lord on a Sunday morning, and we are the only species, the only living beings that have done that throughout the globe. All around the world, people are gathering on Sunday morning to worship the living God because God has put eternity in our hearts, and we know that there is a God, and that this life is not all that there is. As a matter of fact, you know, now just think about it. There are people today, because of the whole movement of pantheism and different things, they want to let, raise the animal kingdom to the same level as us. Now, I want to grant you that if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're, you are on an animal plane. You basically have body and soul or conscious awareness, and that's what animals have. They have a physical body, and they're, oh, and your dog's looking at you. He's alive. He's well. But you, you didn't see dogs gathering together for adult Sunday school studying their Bibles this morning, did you? You got a dog. He's at home. You could try to talk to him about Jesus all day long. Fido, do you want to go to heaven? <laughs> he just wants to know where his kibbles and bits are. He, you know, he just... He's a dog. You, you don't see, hey, what's happening with that herd of cows out there in the pasture? They're gathered up. They're having a worship service. That's what's going on. Doesn't happen, right? We're the only people. As a matter of fact, not only do we're the only species that has a relationship with God or has the capacity for that, I know people that don't know God. They're basically body, body and soul, but they're not spirit. They, they don't have that full uh, dimension of God's, the born-again experience. And so, true, they're going to live like a dog and die like a hog. That's what they're going to do. But even at the most pagan, unsaved, wicked, evil people's funerals I've ever been to in my life, it's funny to me. Ever got a beer in their hand, shot, man. They're oh, and, oh, Bob, he's, he's with the Lord. He's driving truck in the streets of gold. He's like, Really? There's probably no place on the planet where more lies are told than funerals. Because the Bible says, you know, you want, or, you know the word eulogize means to speak well of someone. And sometimes you really got to fight and work hard to speak well of somebody. Because they don't have a lot going on, right? And yet the most 
ungodly person that wants nothing to do with Jesus, nothing to do with the Bible, nothing to do with church, nothing to do with Christians, and they're all gathered up, they're drinking, they're getting drunk, and he's in a better place. Yeah? You know that the Bible clearly teaches heaven and hell? And there are those who are going to go be with the Lord, ask them from the body to be present with the Lord, and those who are going to hell? Isn't that a st- subject and a reality you really don't want to talk about? And granted, I don't talk about it when a family is grieving. But isn't it biblical reality? You see, God has put eternity in our hearts, even for the unsaved person. I've looked at unsaved people, and once again, they want nothing to do with Jesus, the Bible, church, or Christians. I say, when you die, where are you going to go? Well, I hope heaven. So, well, you would be really uncomfortable in heaven. Yeah? Why would I be uncomfortable with heaven? Well, we worship the Lord, we believe his word, and we're going to just love one another for eternity. And you don't want to do that now. So why would you want to do it then? God's a perfect gentleman. You don't want anything to do with him. And so he's going to give you your choice. You want an eternity separated from him? Because right now you're living a life without God, and therefore he's just going to give you an eternity without God. But eternity's in your heart. You're an eternal being. You are going to live and exist forever. Just depends on what side of the tracks you want to be on. Will you bow your knee to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father? Or will you go through this life rejecting God and hoping that there's a back door to get in? Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. There's no other way to step into the eternal realm of God without Jesus as your Savior and His blood that washes away your sins. Now he tells us here though, He tells God God has put eternity in our hearts. He tells us that nobody can find out from the beginning to the end what God is doing. And he also tells us that whatever God has done, it's it's complete. It's, It's perfect. You can't add to it. You can't take away from it. So that people would fear God in verse 14. So that we would fear God. You see, I realize this. If God is doing a work in my life and your life, and I can't add to it, take away from it, and he does it so that I'd fear him. As I go through the difficulties and struggles of life and embracing the seasons and times of life, I can go through that one of two ways. I can go through it saying, Lord, I surrender to you. I submit to you. I don't understand what's going on. Honestly, I'm having a hard time through this season, but I trust you. Or I can go through it like, God, I'm mad at you. I'm resentful. I, I got a beef with you. I know a lot of Christians like that that they're really not enjoying life. You see, the centerpiece of that little passage about eternity is under the sun in verse 13 when it tells us that, you know, the the gift that God has given you is to eat and drink and enjoy this gift of God. He's not saying eat and drink and party like you might think. He's saying, hey, just enjoy your daily life. You know, every day, yesterday I had such a blessed day, not only praying and studying and preparing my message, but going for a prayer walk with my wife, having lunch with my wife, having dinner with my wife, and just enjoying life. It's a gift from God. But he tells us, he tells us that God has an eternal plan. Now, this is the problem. You and I are living in times and seasons, and we're under this heaven and under the sun. And aren't you troubled at times in your life when life slaps you in the face with the positives and negatives and the adversities and the blessings of life, and we don't know what's going on? You see, I don't know about you, but when we were... Uh, we had small children. In the wintertime, when things are dark and cold for a long time, yearly we would get these great big jigsaw puzzles. That's what we did as a family. And so in the winter nights, we would have something to do. We would talk and we'd laugh and drink, you know, hot tea or cocoa, whatever. And we'd just have fun around a table putting a jigsaw puzzle together. We'd get a 500-piece, a 750-piece, or a 1,000-piece, whatever we felt ambitious enough to do. And it would be on the table usually for like six weeks because nightly we would do some things. Now, the thing about a puzzle, if, you've, if you're a puzzle per- person, is that you get this puzzle, we, me and the kids, we'd go and we'd pick a puzzle, and then we would, we'd do this puzzle. Now, when you first open the box and you scatter the pieces, the first four things to discover are really quick, right? The corners. Just two straight sides. Okay, who's going to find the corner? I got one, I got one, I got one. You find the corners like, bam, you got the corners. And then you find all the sides, all the straight sides. Okay, everybody, we got the sides. And in pretty short, in pretty quick order, you have the corners and you have the sides. You have the boundaries of the puzzle, right? But then it takes all the time to fill in the gaps. Now, let me tell you, it is impossible to do a puzzle without what? A picture, right? You get the box, you sand it up on end like that. And all the way through, here's the puzzle. Here's the box. We're always looking. Oh, I think this is that piece. And and we're looking at the picture. 
But you and I are going through life, and our life is like a puzzle, and we don't have the picture. We don't have the picture, right? Who has the picture? God has the picture. He sees you as a completed, finished work. He sees it. Nobody's going to add to it. Nobody's going to take away from it because he sees you in your final condition. And as he sees it, you know, this is, this is what happened every single year. Every, every, every time we did a puzzle, the same thing happened. We'd get about halfway, and we'd get to a really hard spot, really hard spot, and we couldn't find the pieces. You ever have that? Everybody's looking for these. We can't find the piece. And we'd all begin to, I think they forgot it. It's not in the box. The company messed up. We want our money back. Did we keep that receipt? We're going to take this thing back. We don't like this stupid thing. We can't find these four pieces of the puzzle. We would say that first. It's, it's lost. And then after that, I would look at our little brown schnauzer. His name was Brownie. And I'd look at my daughter because it was her dog. Especially at that moment, it was her dog. And I'd look at him and I said, Jessica, I think Brownie ate some of our pieces to the puzzle. And she'd look at Brownie with an evil suspicion. Now, she taught him since he was a puppy, when she wanted him to leave her room, she'd say, Brownie, no, no boys allowed. And so she'd look at him, Brownie, no boys allowed. And he would scurry out with his you know, ears down and tail tucked between his legs. But you know, the same thing happened every single time. We found those pieces. Brownie was exonerated. He was acquitted of the charges that were leveled against him. He was guilty until proven innocent, right? Unlike the American way. He was, you oh, schnauzer, I've got you eating my pieces to my puzzle. We always found the pieces of the puzzle. Brownie didn't need them, and it became complete. And we looked at that, and we looked at the picture, and the two were identical. Happened year after year. In your life, you're going through these things, and, and we're in times and we're in season. All we can see is what is now and in our past. I think that's the joy of those who are, are in their 70s and 80s, and they know the Lord when they can really surrender these things to the Lord, is that basically all the pieces to the puzzle, you see right there at the end of the puzzle, when you've only got a little spot, it goes pretty quick. Right, Because you've got the whole picture. And people who are older and they've been walking with the Lord, they look back at their life, they're in their 70s, they're in their 80s, and go, wow, look what God has done in my life. Look what God has done in my life. Look what God has done in my life. And I just praise God for that. If they're in that place of surrendering to the process of God. But I know some people, they really don't have a peace. They still got this resentment. They got this bitterness. They didn't get this. They thought that was going to turn out that way. All of us have those things, don't we? We thought life was going to turn out different. But it is what it is. And this is what God has allowed. I'll meet every now and then, even in the church, Christians, those who have received Christ, but they're really angry with God. And I'll start talking to them about their life. And they're pretty pleasant. They're pretty, you know, uh, congenial until you kind of put your finger on and say, hey, you know what's God doing in your life? Well, I'm kind of mad at God. Whoa, Really? As a matter of fact, when I get to heaven, i got some questions for God. Okay. I'm sure God's in heaven trembling that you have questions for him. you got questions for God. And God's, oh, no, they're coming. But, you know, in our humanness, we kind of exalt ourselves in our pride. i got some questions for God. I think it would be amazing. I'm just going to play out a little picture that I've seen in, in my mind. It, it, it's not real, but I just think about it, you know, and you die and you go be with the Lord, and you're that guy that's shaking his fist in God's face. And, oh, it's just i got some questions for God. And you get to heaven, and there's this huge auditorium with these, this great big doorway, and it says, those who have questions for God, enter here. He walks in there. All right. He walks in, and let me tell you, the auditorium is packed. Myriads, as far as you can see, seats. People that got questions, and he's like, oh, man, I'm in the right place. Got questions for, look at all these people got questions for God. He walks down to the front because he wants to be dead center. And he finds a seat right there in the front. He can't believe it. With all the people there, he, he found a place. And he sits down. Sits down. The guy next to him, to his, to his right, leans over and says, hey, you got some questions for God? He says, man, I got some questions for God. Who are you? Job. Job. The guy that lost his 10 kids in one tragic accident. Mm-hmm. Job lost everything he had, all, all his wealth and possessions in one day. That's me. The guy that lost his health from the top of his head to the sole of his foot, he had these boils that oozing pus was coming out of him. And, and, 
and you had to scrape it off with a piece of pottery? One and only. That's me. What are your questions? Um, well, I thought, uh, you know, hey, what's your name? <laughs> and as he turns to his left to see what his name, a guy with his head of a John the Baptist. How do you know? You can't mistake the silver platter. There he is. His head's on it. John the Baptist. You got some questions? Yeah. I'm not doing well. I got Job to the right. I got John the Baptist to the left. How about, how about the guy over here? Oh, what's your name? Isaiah. You see, tradition says that King Manasseh put has King I, or, uh, pro, the prophet Isaiah in a hollow log and sawed it in two. He, you, he doesn't have a name badge. You know it's Isaiah because he's the guy beside himself. He's sawn in two. And Isaiah's like, oh, you got some questions? John's about, you got some questions? And John said, hey, you got some questions? He said, you know what? I, I think I'm in the wrong place. I don't think I have any questions anymore. I think, is there, is there one that I could just go and, and sing Kumbaya with some people or something? Because I don't think I have any questions anymore. You see, one of the difficult things about life for you and me is that we cannot see in the mind of the artist the painting that he's painting. We cannot see in the mind of the potter what he's forming in our life. And it is the good, the bad, and the ugly of our life that goes together in this collage, this masterpiece that God has created in your life and my life. He takes it all. You say, well, what about these dark seasons and this awful thing and this, ba this tragedy? Well, that's kind of the black backdrop to the brilliancy and the color of the grace that God has revealed to you and me. And you and I can move through this life embracing life and all that it comes, man. Just bring on the good, the bad, and the ugly. Daily I'm going to enjoy God for who he is. And, and when things happen, you know, there's been many times in my 30 years of walking with the Lord, things are happening in my life that I honestly don't understand. And I ask the Lord, I said, Lord, what is going on? I can't believe you let this happen. Or how could that happen? Or how could these precious people go through this? And you know, a lot of times, I still don't have answers for those things. But I want you to know this is what I do. Why would I give up what I know for sure to cave in to doubts that I have no answers to? This is what I know for sure, and I fall back on what I know. I know that God loves me. I know that he gave his son to die on the cross for my sins, to shed his blood, to be buried and to rise from the dead, and that he's coming back again, and that he's written my name in the Lamb's book of life, and I know I'm on my way to heaven. That's what I know for sure. Well, what about all these other things? I don't know a lot of that. But I find people are really not enjoying a quality of life because they honestly have not embraced all that their life has made up, the sum of its parts and pieces and pieces to the puzzle. And you know what? From this day forward, I just want to share with you, yes, we have times and seasons under this heaven but God's looking at our life from an eternal perspective and he's doing things in our life to create what he wants to create through the pain and the heartache and the tears and the laughter and the dancing and the joy and the sorrow of life to create for himself a people. As Paul said, this, this light affliction is not to be compared to the weight of glory that God is producing in us. And you know what? My heart just goes out for you today. I really, really, really honestly want you to enjoy the best life you possibly can. And for some, that means giving up some resentments and doubts and anger and maybe even hostility towards the Lord this morning. That you might leave a free person rather than the person that came in bound in the bondage of your own attitudes, your own perspectives, and the limited humanness of who we are. Let's pray. Father, we just ask that your Holy Spirit would do a work that only you can do. And Lord, we, Lord, I, I just, my heart's overwhelmed this morning for those who are here that are really struggling with some issues. And I don't know the details of them. The people around them don't know the details. None of us need to know. Lord, I thank you that you know. I thank you that you know. Lord, I ask in your Holy Spirit right now that you would do heart surgery 
that you would bring a transformation that s- there are those who are here that could, they could leave this bundle, this burden, this package, Lord, at your feet and walk away from it and trust you with their lives. That they might be able to have lunch this afternoon and dinner with their family and with the lightness of heart and the joy in their soul, enjoy this day as a gift of God. Lord, I just pray that you would do that work right now supernaturally by your spirit in the souls of men and women. As we're just in an attitude of prayer right now, the Spirit of the Lord is just ministering to you. There's something that, you know what, you just want to leave this with the Lord. It's been a burden. It's been a struggle. It has reduced the, the really enjoyment and the quality of your life. I just want to invite you by faith to stand up wherever you're at in this room. And we're going to pray for you that we can leave that with the Lord. And none of us know what's going on. It doesn't matter what's happening from our perspective. It matters what's happening to you. God bless you guys over there. Anybody else, do you want to just leave something at the Lord's feet? There's a sorrow of heart. There's a bitterness. There's this huge question mark with an exclamation point after it that has just robbed you, robbed you of enjoying life. Anybody else before we pray? Don't worry about what the person in front of you or next to you is thinking. They don't need to know what's going on. This is a very one-on-one time with you and Jesus. And we want to pray for you. But can I just encourage you, don't, don't leave here the way you came in. Don't leave here the way you came in. Let's lay it at the Lord's feet. God bless you guys all over the room. Let's pray right now. Join me with me in this prayer. Just repeat it in your heart. May it be a cry of our soul to the Lord together for those who are standing by faith. Lord Jesus, please forgive me. for the bitterness of my soul. Please forgive me for the resentment that's been growing in my heart and mind over this issue. Lord, I just confess I don't understand it. And how many times I said, Lord, how could you allow this in my life? Lord, I've really let it Label me and identify me as a broken vessel that is not enjoying this life that you've given. And Lord, by faith right now, Lord, I I just give it to you. I don't know how to rid myself, Lord, of this heartache. I don't know how to rid myself of these emotions, Lord. I don't know how to rid myself of these thoughts that come on like a flood, Lord, about this issue. I I don't know how, Lord. But by faith, I just stand before you this morning. And by faith, I give it to you, Lord. As a package of brokenness. And I ask that you would take it from me. And I pray that you would fill in the void and the vacuum and the gap inside of me. With your love and your joy and your peace and a faith that can trust God that you are the great artist you are the great puzzle maker and you see my life is complete and so Lord who who else am I going to trust besides you and so I just give you the burdens of my heart my soul and I pray that you would fill me with the abundant life of your spirit and I ask it in Jesus name Amen.